Good evening. I'm Jim Zirin, and you are watching The Digital Age. We are continuing this evening our analysis of the tragedy in Boston and whether that tragedy could have been averted. With us is Richard Falkenrath. Richard Falkenrath is the former deputy commissioner for counterterrorism of the city of New York, the New York Police Department. He is also a principal of the Chertoff Group, a firm of management consultants with, which operates in the security area, and he's a contributing editor of Bloomberg News. Richard, welcome back. Thank you, Jim. Now, what's your sense of what really happened? Do you think that these were self-radicalized terrorists, or do you think that they were part of a wider terrorist network? We have to work with the evidence we've gotten in the public domain right now. There's really no evidence that they were part of a larger network, that they were recruited and trained, as we've seen in past terrorist attempts by Al Qaeda. Uh, they undoubtedly had some assistance in their in their mental progression, perhaps online, maybe an imam. Who knows? Uh, we don't have the definitive story on that, and we may never, as a matter of fact, since there's only one left, and he only has to tell the story if he wants to. Well, there are two unanswered questions, I suppose. One is, where do they get the money? Uh, there seemed to be some financing around. Uh, the older one made a trip to Russia. Uh, they had to buy the materials uh, for use in the attack, and they had to support themselves uh, while they were preparing. Um, yeah, the I mean, there's a lot of unanswered questions. The money is one. By now, the FBI will probably be to the bottom of their finances, and because that's one of the first things they'll look for to see if they had any uh, support from an external entity of some kind. Uh, whether they have or not will come out when, they have ch when they're formally indicted and the case is brought forward in court. Until then, the government has no reason to divulge that to the public. Um, I suppose there are other questions as to what happened during the famous trip to Russia. Uh, did uh, uh, Tamerlan uh, uh, meet with uh, terrorists there? Was he trained in uh, how to make a bomb, how to detonate a bomb? This is a very important question, and that does look like the most important trip. One of the patterns we've seen with past terrorist attacks is foreign travel is often a key time to get trained, to get motivated, to get organized around an attack. The interesting thing about this, though, is when you investigate it, when the U.S. government investigates a question like this, they are compelled, more or less, to work through the government of the country that we're talking about, so in this case, the Russian government. And as you know, our relationship with the Russian government is somewhat strained at the moment, and they're not exactly trusted in Washington in all quarters. And so it's a little bit troubling uh, when you have to rely on an, uh, another party, the Russian government, the former KGB in this case, the FSB, as essentially your source of information about what happened. Now, it's uh, said the brothers Tsarnaev uh, got their uh, recipe for making a bomb on the Internet. Uh, now, uh, undoubtedly, there are a lot of recipes for making bombs on the Internet, but because you have the recipe doesn't mean you can do it. Doesn't it require some level of training beyond uh, what's in a recipe? Um, it requires an element of skill. Uh, so you need to be somewhat handy. You need to be able to work a basic primer in the electronics of the firing device. Uh, but the basic designs for these, uh, these improvised explosive devices were available even before the Internet age. I mean, the anarchist handbook from the early 1970s contained uh, designs for pipe bombs and other sorts of bombs. Um, so these two brothers, I mean, it, when, you, when you first look at it, uh, if they'd only been here a week or two, I think you would have had to assume that they had received foreign assistance. But these were people, they were not completely incompetent, feckless people. And they did live here for an extended period of time, which would have given them the luxury of taking their time, studying it, preparing it. It's impressive, however, that neither of the devices failed. I mean, I take note of that. Uh, what you've seen in many other attacks, including the Times Square bombing in May 1st, 2010, was essentially a failed improvised explosion. And the underwear device. bomber, his, his bomb also, essentially failed. Also failed. Uh, so the, you know, enough things came together that, it, that it, from the bomber's perspective, it worked. Now, isn't it necessary to test the bomb as well and under test conditions? Because it could blow up in your face if you didn't know what you were it's doing. It's desirable, yeah. but not necessary. Yeah. Um, and in fact, one of the plots that was thwarted by uh, the NYPD and the FBI working together against New York City in 2008, they did test the part of the explosive in Denver before bringing it here. Uh, now, let's uh, talk about the NYPD, with which uh, you uh, have an intimate familiarity, and compare it with, uh, with Boston. I mean, for one thing, in, in New York, we have a much larger police force 
It was, uh, than in Boston. A much larger city and much larger police force. So the NYPD is by far the largest police department in the country, over 35,000 sworn officers. The smallest precinct in New York City is bigger than the average police department uh, in the country. And that size permits a degree of specialization in things like counterterrorism and intelligence that a smaller department could never do. And uh, so they have nothing comparable in Boston. So they'll have a few detectives assigned to the Joint Terrorism Task Force. That's customary, but they won't. And they'll have a few former members of the military, uh, or uh, who will have joined after they, you know, got out of the army or the Marines. But no, they're not going to have anything like the highly specialized capabilities of the NYPD. Now we hear a lot about the Joint Terrorist Task Force. So why don't you tell us uh, what that is? So the FBI learned a long time ago, in fact, in the early 1980s, that when it investigated a major terrorist case inside the country, they needed to collaborate and work together with other agencies, with other law enforcement agencies. And if they didn't, they ran the real risk of sort of blue-on-blue -blue violence. So uh, someone that you thought was a terrorist would be simultaneously investigated or might be the undercover of another agency. So. The FBI brought together all the different uh, law enforcement agencies involved in a, in, in a municipal area into what's called the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And the officers assigned to it are deputized as U.S. Marshals. So actually, although they are a member of the Boston PD or the NYPD or whatever, uh, they are, have the authorities of a federal law enforcement agency and work together with their federal partners to investigate the cases. Under our legal system, um, most terrorist offenses are offenses under federal law, and they will typically preempt the state law in that area. So the ultimate authority, from a legal standpoint, for the investigation and prosecution of terrorist cases usually resides with the federal government. And hence, in a formal sense, the JTF is the preeminent investigative body uh, for major cases. Now, I think uh, Commissioner Ray Kelly has reported that the NYPD has thwarted uh, 16 terrorist attacks since 9-11. Uh, was this all, uh, and I know probably many of them were uh, while you were there as Deputy Commissioner, was this all with the assistance of the Joint Terrorist Task Force? No, a couple of them that I don't know exactly which of the 16 he's referring to. There have been a lot of incidents and cases. A couple of them were done purely by the NYPD acting in its municipal unilateral capacity. Uh, and as, as you know and as we've talked about before, the NYPD does maintain its own intelligence division, which has many of the capabilities that ordinarily exist only in the JTF. It has them as well. They operate with different techniques and under different legal authorities because they're operating under state law and municipal guidance. Um, so that's an extra advantage that New York City has that most, in fact, all other American cities do not have. For example, every time there's a terrorist attack anywhere in the world, such as Mumbai or Amman, Jordan, uh, the NYPD dispatches detectives from uh, the counterterrorism uh, unit to uh, sort of ask the New York question. Yes, that's what, that's what Commissioner Kelly puts it. I don't think they can go everywhere. There have been a lot of attacks in Iraq and Pakistan where it's difficult to get into. It's very dangerous. But certainly studying terrorist tradecraft is part of the job. Uh, and the NYPD and all the serious counterterrorism operations need to understand what the adversary is up to, how they work, what the latest techniques are for the purpose of figuring out how to counter them and indeed to prepare for them. So one of the examples was a very uh, terrible attack against Mumbai, which was a multiple active shooter situation where teams were brought in from Pakistan, attacked Mumbai with fully automatic weapons, went on for a very long period of time. The, the police in India were unable to resolve it. Once that happened, that was a slightly different method than we'd seen from other terrorist organizations, which previously had been focused on bombings. Uh, and the NYPD immediately began a training and tactical adjustment to deal with that sort of scenario here. Not because of any indication it was about to happen, but because we'd seen the technique abroad and it's their job to prepare for that. Well, that was a little different in terms of a terrorist attack, wasn't it? Because instead of having suicide attackers, uh, you had uh, shooters who uh, eventually went out in a blaze of glory. I think all of them except one were killed. Yeah, and he's uh, now and, been executed. And now he's been executed. So now we have uh, two of them in Boston. One of them has been killed, and the other one is uh, awaiting trial where he may uh, face the death penalty. Yeah, no, we've never seen anything like in the United States, the Mumbai-style attack with multiple teams, and it, it, it's a very difficult tactical challenge. Now, the budget of the uh, NYPD overall is about $4.6 billion. I think it's uh, a lot more when you include pension and health, long care, health care. Well, costs. perhaps that's right. Now, how much of that is uh, devoted to uh, counterterrorism? I'm not sure what the exact numbers were. I mean, we, uh, for most of the 
police of the cost of the police department is uh, personnel costs, so salaries and overtime and that sort of thing. The more interesting part was the discretionary budget, which was for procurement of technology and special equipment. Um, and in the counterterrorism area, that was in the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, while, uh, while I was there. I'm not sure what it is today. Much of that comes from the federal government in the form of grants, uh, which are put to good use by agencies like the NYPD. Now, just turning to intelligence, uh, the NYPD uh, says it has very close ties to the Muslim community, to the imams and to the leaders of the Muslim community in an effort to try to identify uh, uh, people who might become radicalized. Uh, they don't have anything like that in Boston, do they? Uh, I'm not sure. They do have a Muslim community in Boston, and yeah. all local precinct commanders have a relationship with the entities in their jurisdiction. So I think all mosques and Islamic community centers and that sort of thing in America are regarded as part of the community where the local police are looking out for the public safety of them. And they're not a presumption that they're a threat. They're actually part of the fabric of the society in the but, city. Uh, in New York, uh, we're said to have informants within the community and also to have undercover officers who work within the community. Yeah, yeah that, and so the engagement occurs at multiple levels. What, what you're referring to is a method of investigating threats and the sort of pursuit of leads, which can be pursued in several different ways. Two of the techniques are what you just referred to. One is an informant, the other is an undercover, who's like an informant but just happens to work for the police department, to be a police officer. Well, we had this uh, famous incident where uh, Tamerlan uh, uh, had a burst of temper in the mosque and uh, denounced the fact that they were celebrating Martin Luther King Day and they were celebrating Thanksgiving and he didn't think they should be celebrating uh, United States holidays. And uh, he uh, got out of there. Uh, now, isn't that the sort of incident that might have been reported in New York based uh, with your ears to the ground the way they, they were and should have been? Possibly. It's also not impossible that uh, an, an informant or an asset, in the, to use the term of art, yeah. an asset of some other a a law enforcement agency would have picked up on that and reported it either. Now, uh, um, I suppose you're familiar with the murder of, uh, of three uh, young men in Waltham on 9-11-2011. Uh, 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 their throats were slit, and at least one of them, perhaps two, were friends of Tamerlan Sarnayev, and uh, the Boston police never followed up with that. Uh, would you view that as something that wouldn't have happened in New York? Um, well, it's, it's, there's, a lot, there's a lot of supposition in that sequence of questions. I'll point out one relevant difference, though, which is Waltham is not part of Boston. So yes. it, doesn't, it doesn't have the jurisdiction. The Boston PD don't have jurisdiction there. And this is an issue with law enforcement in general in America is the jurisdictions are so small, it's often difficult to perceive patterns across different jurisdictions when you have these tiny little police departments. Now, the NYPD, because of the municipal consolidation that occurred in the, in the mid-19th century, is vast, and the odds, just because of the scale, 300 square miles and 8 million people in the municipal area, the odds of it detecting a pattern across, you know, uh, borough boundaries are somewhat higher. Um, but if it had occurred outside of the jurisdiction of the NYPD in an entirely different area, it's not, there's no guarantee. Uh, that you would have detected the pattern if, in fact, this turns out to be part of a pattern. Now, the uh, Russians, uh, we hear, uh, tipped us off not once but twice about Tamerlan, that he'd been radicalized. Uh, and uh, I think as a result, the CIA put him on a watch list of some kind. Uh, in addition, there was a story out there that the Saudis uh, warned us about Tamerlan and based on intelligence they'd obtained in, in Yemen. Yeah. Uh, now, if that had been uh, reported to the FBI, and as apparently it was, isn't that something that would come through the Joint Terrorism Task Force and the NYPD would have learned about if, uh, if it had happened in New York? Um, there are two steps to that. It certainly should have come. If, if this person were in the New York area, it should have come to uh, the Joint Terrorism Task Force in New York City. And then, depending on the credibility and the investigative steps taken by the JTF, it may or may not have been reported to the NYPD. This is a relationship that I was in the middle of uh, for a period of time, and it's a complicated one. Um, and there's a number of different issues that go into that decision. But I think if the facts are as they've been reported in the press, and I think the, the Russian government has an interest in having it come out that they told us twice, 
that this happened, and maybe some of the bureaucratic opponents of the FBI have an interest in having this come out. If so, then there's definitely an intelligence failure. Uh, President ba Obama said that he thought the FBI had done its job. I mean, do you agree with that? Uh, he's got a lot more information than I do. He also has an interest in protecting the actions of his own administration. So it's too soon to say. I know this will be investigated further, but as I said, if the facts are as reported, that you had three different reports from different from two different governments and preliminary investigative steps taken by the local FBI, and they failed to keep an eye on him, and he then carried out a terrible terrorist attack against our country, that that's what we call a failure. I think there have been uh, at least uh, five uh, people involved in uh, terrorism since 9-11 who were interviewed by the FBI, and then they went on to pursue terrorist activities. I mean, their, their track record isn't very good, is it? Um, well, there's a couple things to be said about that. So it, it isn't perfect, and if you evaluate it, I'm not here to defend the FBI, but if you evaluate only on the, on the failures and the slip-ups, it doesn't look very good. There are other successes on the other end of the spectrum, but I think it's important to talk about the FBI and how it conducts investigations. It is really subject to extremely tight and rigorous control. But under the law, under jurisprudence, and many, many different court cases, under attorney general guidelines and their own FBI guidelines. And so for every individual case that comes in, there are certain, there's a sequence of steps that has to be gone through for every in, uh, individual investigative technique that's used to investigate that case. So if you get a, a real hot threat, something that looks like a ticking time bomb situation, which we've had, and lived through, uh, <laughs> through it, Everything is suddenly on the table and it's available. But if you have a murkier situation where you can't evaluate the credibility and all you have is a single piece of information provided from a source of dubious uh, credibility about someone, we do not have a, a system in America of unlimited state surveillance of people who've been reported upon by one source or another. And this is the structural problem, the essence of the domestic intelligence problem. The country, in times like in the aftermath of Boston, we say we want better domestic intelligence and better prevention. But frankly, in most other times, in most other contexts, Americans and American politicians like a fairly tightly regulated internal security service. Now, uh, the brothers Tsarnaev uh, were Chechens. And uh, Chechnya has been a, a country or a region that has had a, a, a tortured and violent history for at least two centuries. Certainly, uh, the Russians regard them as a terrorist threat uh, because there have been a number of attacks in Moscow which were committed by Chechens. Is this something we'd ignored in the past, which now we have to pay attention to, that they may be directing uh, their anger against the United States? So uh, I, th I don't think we know yet that the reason the brothers Sarnay have decided to attack the Boston Marathon has anything to do with their m mother nationality, where they came from, because as far as I know, they, mo they spent most of their lives outside of Chechnya, and their their formative experiences were in other countries and, frankly, in the Boston area. So I think it's too soon to say it's because they were Chechen. But there is, and we have paid a great deal of attention to Chechnya since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Prior to the collapse of the Soviet Union, we just sort of ignored it. But since then, we paid a lot of attention to it. But not... We as, being the intelligence community. And the foreign policy community, yes. the State Department. and It's a big deal, but not as a threat to American interests or the American homeland. A threat as, rather, a, as a, one of the crucibles of Russia deciding how it was going to deal with the peoples on its periphery. Uh, and there it's been a, a terrible experience, in fact. Um, and the, this has led to one of the sources of tension in U.S.-Russian relations, which is the preference of the Vladimir Putin and the other leaders of the Russian Federation for us to join them in labeling the te Chechen secessionists as terrorists, broadly. And it, both President Bush, who I worked for, and President Obama uh, had declined to do that broadly. And so the Russians, for, in a way, are likely to see, to see this as a kind of I told you so come up its moment. Um, nonetheless, the dominant uh, view of uh, the United States foreign policy elite on the Chechen problem is not as a terrorist problem, but in fact a problem of a nationalities, uh, the relationship of the Chechen people to the Russian people, who, as you noted, have historically subjugated them. Now, uh, are we being too politically correct in our approach uh, to terrorists? Uh, of course, not uh, all Muslims are terrorists. Not, I mean, most Muslims aren't terrorists, but. 
Uh, certainly a lot of the terrorists have been Muslims. Uh, and now we find that some terrorists, and indeed a number of terrorists in Russia, have been Chechens. Uh, should we be, uh, profiling is a bad word, but should we be focusing more on those communities in an effort to determine who might have been radicalized and who was uh, uh, an Islamic terrorist? Um, I got to come back to the structure of domestic intelligence in the United States, which doesn't permit large-scale state surveillance and, and intelligence gathering on communities based on profiling. I mean, you need specific, the term of art here is predication, specific information about specific people of specific threats in order to have permission to go investigate them. The rules are a little bit different at the local level. Uh, which is one of the interesting things about the NYPD experience, but broadly at the federal level, it doesn't work to say we're now focused on an entire class of people, let's investigate them based on just their, those general characteristics. You need something specific about a person in order to really go at them. Well, they eliminated uh, the phrase Islamist terrorism from the FBI training manuals. I mean, do you think that was uh, sensible? Uh, I mean, isn't it accurate uh, that there is Islamist terrorism? You know, I spent, I spent eight years as an academic. As you know, I was a, as a professor at Harvard University before I went to the White House. And there was, the academics spent a lot of time debating labels and root causes and that sort of thing. I didn't have a lot of time for it. So right. to this day, I'm not exactly sure what the labels mean and why you would get into them. If you have a threat, it's usually identifiable. You investigate it as best you can using all the tools at your disposal, and you resolve it before it can kill anyone. How we label things and talk about things, I mean, you know, it's really not uh, something that's preoccupied me much, certainly since I've left government. Let's just talk a little more about the Internet. Uh, you had uh, Anwar al-Awaki, who was uh, described as uh, the bin Laden of the Internet, uh, and uh, his colleague uh, Samir Khan, both of them uh, were killed in a drone attack in, uh, in Yemen, killed by the United States. Uh, Awaki was uh, involved in inciting the Fort Hood shooter uh, to violence. Uh, and perhaps through Samir Khan, there's some relationship, it's said, with uh, Tamerlan Tsarnaev. Uh, is there really uh, some way that we could control the Internet or at least find out who's hitting these sites? and? Uh, and determine whether or not they are people who are being radicalized by uh, the message um, there? Control it? No. You cannot. Con I mean, it would take an entire revolution in American uh, telecommunications policy and law to control the Internet in any meaningful way. But monitor it, yes. Uh, it's much easier when it's foreign servers with foreign nationals on them than we monitor it with intelligence authorities. But even when it's U.S. persons, it can be monitored. And in fact, the most powerful investigative techniques, once we have the original lead, are in fact electronic and about exploiting the electronic communications of the subjects of the investigation. So we would have been able to find out uh, what websites Tamerlan visited and what uh, websites uh, his brother Jokar visited, and uh, C uh, would be a, another. Uh, link in the chain of uh, seeing whether they'd become radicalized and whether well, they'd become the inter operational. Well, here's the interesting thing. If, if a foreign individual was abroad, you could monitor what websites they were, they were selecting just based on the discretion of the intelligence community. At home, you can't do that, and it would require what's called a warrant from a federal judge. And if it was a terrorism case, it would be the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act Court, the FISC. They would have to authorize that kind of monitoring of someone like Sarnayev. And in the absence of significant, as I said, predication, that is, inf information about that person, no warrants like that would be granted, and the federal government would not be permitted to gather that information about you routinely. Uh, what about uh, surveillance cameras? Do you think we're going to see more surveillance cameras as a result of the Boston attacks? There are very few surveillance cameras in Boston. They're Really not so many in New York, many fewer than London, which is a smaller city. I'm not sure that's right. I mean, there's a lot of them, and there's a lot more they're coming. And sure, there's going to be more. I mean, it's a secular trend, there's no question, and there will continue to be more. This day and age, one of the most interesting things about Boston is not just the, the surveillance cameras that are mostly on the fronts of, store, of stores, uh, but video cameras and uh, cell phones and that sort of thing, which are immediately available to everyone. That, that was, in some ways, the new part of the Boston uh, incident. Well, but, the incriminating evidence came from the private sector, didn't it? So it seems. I mean, we, we're not privy to the details of what we call the, the, the video canvas, the, the going through of all the different data. We're not sure exactly which camera it was that best identified these two individuals that was ultimately released. May have been a private one, may have been a public one. 
Well, I have a, a question for you, Richard Falkenrath. And the question is, if uh, all this had happened in New York, would we likely have been able to uh, thwart the attack? I'd say the odds would have been somewhat more in our favor. Uh, in this business, there are no certainties, so I would never say yes categorically, but there are a few other techniques, a, few, a somewhat more uh, intense focus on this activity that I think would have given us um, a few advantages that Boston didn't for the basic preventative function. Richard Falkenrath, this has been just marvelous, and uh, thank you so much for coming by. Thank you, Jim. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more on the digital age. Please visit our website at www.digitalage.org. For the digital age, I'm Jim Zirin. Good night and all the best.